Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Hanitio Guzman. I'm a medical student here at our Health Science Center, and I serve as the president of our student body. On behalf of our Center for the Medical Humanities and Ethics and our Student Government Association, I'd like to welcome all of you to our campus. Today, you're here gathered with us to take part in our Act Together for Health, Get Your Affordable Care Act Together program, and I thank you for coming. The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, we find ourselves in an historic period of time for our city, our state, and our nation. Irrespective of our personal opinions about the matter, the law of the land now paves the way for U.S. residents and citizens to access health care in a completely unprecedented way. With that said, as professionals, as students, and as community volunteers, we're here today because we're interested in playing a key role in ensuring that information about insurance resources is available in a form meaningful to our communities. Again, for your interest and your involvement, I thank you. In order to better prepare all of us for our leadership journey together, we've put together an exciting program for today. What you can expect is that we're going to get started hearing from a member of our own staff here at the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics about a service learning project that we've put together. You're going to get to hear from Ms. Teresa Nino uh, from the Center for uh, Medicare, Medicaid uh, Services. And then you're going to hear from Dr. Thomas Schlenker, the Director of Public Health at the San Antonio Metropolitan Health District. We'll close out the day by learning a little bit more about the project that we're here to carry out and then we'll actually work to figure out, as teams, how it is that we're going to go and make a positive difference in our community. With that said, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Melanie Stone, our Director for Community Service Learning here at the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics. Welcome. It's wonderful to see so many people here bright and early on a Saturday. Before we get started, I'm pleased to say that now CAS San Antonio is here with us to record today's presentation, which will be available on their website afterwards. So as Hinitio said, my name is Melanie Stone, and I'm with the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics here at the Health Science Center. Our center's mission is to educate students and health professionals in ethics and professionalism while nurturing empathy and humanitarian values. We do this through four key areas, medical ethics and professionalism, literature and art, global health, and community service learning. My role at the center is directing the community service learning program, which I'm gonna abbreviate to CSL. So what is CSL? Well, the formal definition is a structured learning experience that combines community service with mentored preparation and reflection. Students provide service in response to community-identified concerns and learn about the context in which illness develops, the connection between their service and their academic coursework, and their roles as citizens and professionals. So why do CSL? At the center, our, our premise is that CSL is important for all future healthcare providers. The reasons include being able to apply ethical principles, help shape professional identity, and an opportunity to work with and learn from students and other professions, just to name a few. But the bottom line is, a student doing CSL gets a chance to work on a real world project that he or she is passionate about and that meaningfully impacts people. Our CSL project, Act Together for Health, accomplishes just that. So let me set the context for you. As Hinitio said, this is a historic moment in the United States where we're seeking to provide health security for millions of Americans through the Affordable Care Act. But many uninsured people do not know it's available or are skeptical about it. They'll be naturally turning to their trusted community organizations for help and education. Folks, this is a health literacy issue, which is in fact our theme for CSL this year, culminating in a conference in April centered on this topic. Our CSL project, Act Together for Health, will enhance the education efforts of our partnering organizations 
and impact people in our city and county, not just now, but for future generations. By using a CSL model, we are ensuring that our student volunteers receive the preparation they need, which includes today's orientation, that teams are only going to safe, vetted community sites where we've received an invitation rather than knocking randomly on people's doors, and that mentors are guiding the students and reflecting with them along the way. The educational objectives of the project are to better understand our healthcare system and the removal of access barriers facing underserved populations. This is experiential learning at its best, preparing tomorrow's healers to act with compassion and justice. I wanna share our newest project update, which is that the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics is now an official champion for coverage organization as designated by the Center Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that in just a moment. I applaud all of you for joining us today for this important work. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ms. Teresa Nino, who is the Director of the Office of Public Engagement at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The office engages the American public in CMS programs and services such as Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, the Affordable Care Act, and the Health Insurance Marketplace. Ms. Nino's experience ranges from a career in journalism and as a TV reporter, serving as Chicago Mayor Richard Daly's Assistant Press Secretary, and serving as Secretary Donna Shalala's Director of Outreach for Health and Human Services in the Clinton administration. Although she's in DC now, Ms. Nino spent 15 years in San Antonio and thus understands our city's diverse population. This morning, she's gonna provide us a basic overview of the Affordable Care Act, detailed information about the health insurance marketplace and how it impacts Texans, and an update on CMS's outreach and enrollment strategy for the marketplace. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Nino. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you to everybody uh, being here so early and, um, and perky. <laughs> Um, it's a pleasure to be back in San Antonio. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be back in San Antonio. I've gotten some really good food in the last two days. I'm going to go back with a food coma. That's going to be unbelievable. But, um, but to talk about the health insurance marketplace, first of all, let me ask, in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, how many of you can distinguish between Medicare and Medicaid? Oh, good. Good. Um, there's a reason that I ask that because there's a lot of times confusion. Uh, Medicare is the federal program for uh, seniors and also for uh, some people with disabilities and end-stage renal disease. But um, we tell people, remember Medicare because care is caring for our seniors. Medicaid is the program for uh, low-income families. And uh, think of aid, Medicaid, as in helping low-income families. And unlike the Medicare program, uh, Medicaid is different in every state because it's a program that we share with the states. So um, we reimburse the states for their expenses. They determine eligibility and, and other functions of the program. Um, and the reason why I bring this out, because I will make a reference to it later on in the presentation. But um, let me go ahead and get started. Okay, let me see if this is on, yes. Okay, so a lot of you are familiar with the Affordable Care Act. Um, we're calling it Obamacare. A lot of people already learned about it as Obamacare. Um, it's not offensive anymore. We're continuing it with that name. Uh, but really the name is the Patient Protection and Affordability Act, Affordable Care Act. Started in March of 2010. People know it as the Affordable Care Act, ACA, health reform, Either way, it all comes to the same thing. 
You may have heard that it's about 2,000 pages long. It's seven inches tall if you stack it. It has a lot of information. And I will tell you that that is absolutely true. It absolutely is. And the reason for this is that it isn't just about the marketplace. And it isn't just about prevention. This law is a law that looks at the whole healthcare system. And mind you, this is a healthcare system that for the last 50 years has just been growing in expense, growing in size, and it's become unsustainable. So it's looking at the healthcare system in ways that we can change it. So some of the things in the Affordable Care Act, government structure and procedures. What does this mean? We've developed new offices. We now have offices of minority health in several of the um, uh, health and human services agencies. And, um, and just to backstep a little bit, Health and Human Services has numerous agencies, not just CMS, but the Food and Drug Administration, FDA is part of it, National Institutes of Health, NIH. You've heard of the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, that's part of it. Um, a, a whole bunch of uh, agencies, the uh, Health Resource and Service Administration, uh, Substance and Mental Health Service Administration, all of these are agencies within um, HHS. And now many of those have an office of minority health that can look at the health disparities throughout the country, research those, those disparities, and provide solutions to how can we bridge that gap and bring America's health uh, on a level playing field. Um, also, some other offices or, or um, programs that have started uh, Program Integrity, which is a program that looks at fraud, fraud in not just the Medicare system, but also the Medicaid system. And it's also very actively involved in the implementation of the marketplaces. Um, and because of those changes in fraud, um, there are simple things. As, um, in the Medicare program, for example, used to be that uh, when we received a bill for reimbursement to reimburse our providers, we had two weeks to pay that. Now, we, we received a lot of bills in the millions of bills. Um, and in two weeks, we weren't able to check if they were legitimate or not. It would just be too uh, cumbersome. So we would reimburse, and then we would try to chase the money if we found that, uh, that's, that there was fraud going on. So it was always chasing. But now, because of a tweak in the law under the Affordable Care Act, we could suspend and investigate payments. And because of that, we've already recouped billions of dollars, and, and I'll mention that later on also. Um, Another area is the Centers for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight, which is the agency that's really helping with the marketplace implementation. And what they're providing is, just as the name implies, um, consumer information and insurance oversight, consumer protections. So used to be that insurance companies would be able to uh, use your premiums. So when you make your payment, your monthly payment to your insurance company, um, that money they could use on CEO bonuses, on retreats, employee incentives, on a lot of administrative costs, and not necessarily on your health care. And when health care was needed, premiums would go up. So what we've said is 80% of members' premiums have to go back into health care. So now they could only use 20% at administrative cost, and 80% of those premiums have to go into health care. Um, and because of that, several insurance companies had to reimburse members of uh, uh, monies for that. Um, also eliminated lifetime limits. It used to be that if a person uh, got sick, uh, let's say with a, a disease such as like a cancer or something like that, um, they would go for treatment. But if they reached that limit, they would be dropped from their insurance. And this is when they really needed that health, uh, health coverage the most. Um, so those lifetime limits have, ban have been banned. Also, since, um, since the law took effect in March of 2010, uh, we made it illegal for them to deny uh, coverage to children with pre-existing conditions. Starting in January, that's going to be extended to anybody with pre-existing uh, uh, conditions. Um, so anybody with diabetes, asthma, any kind of pre-existing condition, if they want to switch insurance companies, they can't be rejected because of their uh, condition. Um, so again, a lot of these under consumer protections. Um, how many of you have heard of the First Lady's uh, Let's Move campaign? Right, the fight against obesity. That is part of our prevention program. Our prevention program is it's better to get in there and prevent disease than treat disease when it's already in place and it's much more expensive, it's cumbersome, it's difficult for families. So um, 
We know obesity is the gateway to a lot of other diseases, so we're really fighting against obesity. And I believe this year marked the first year that we started to see a stalling on uh, childhood obesities. Um, so again, we're starting to see a little bit of progress here. Uh, we've also made it possible uh, under the Affordable Care Act to have a lot of uh, preventive tests, such as diabetes exams, cancer exams like mammograms, um, now are absolutely free, no charge. Again, because it is much cheaper or much better for our whole healthcare system if we could prevent disease. Um, and I'll mention a little thing again um, on the Medicare program. It used to be that in Medicare, you can get help from your doctor or your doctor will get reimbursed if he helps you quit smoking. But in order for that to be eligible, in order for that to take place, you first had to have a smoking disease. So if you had throat cancer, they could help you quit smoking. But before that, you couldn't. So again, a tweak in the law, a focus on prevention. Under the Affordable Care Act, smoking cessation programs are now available, and doctors could get uh, reimbursed for that if they help their patients to quit smoking. So again, prevention really is a large part. Actually, I would even go as far as to say it's the backbone of the Affordable Care Act. And today, what we're going to talk about is this other part. And let me stand further back here. Is this other part? of the whole Affordable Care Act, which is the marketplaces. And this is what's gonna be starting soon. We're gonna start enrolling people in October. You're gonna hear me keep saying that over and over. And, um, and they actually have until March. We would love for them to enroll before uh, December so that they could get coverage as early as January 1st, but they have that opportunity to enroll anytime during that enrollment period. And I think we're gonna be taking questions at the end of this. Okay, so um, just jot them down so, um, so we can make sure everybody's um, on message here. And on the Affordable Care Act accomplishments, um, many of you have probably already heard that under the Affordable Care Act, uh, young adults can stay on their parents' health insurance until 26 years of age. Well, 3.1 million young adults are already doing that because of that. Um, I mentioned some of the uh, discounts. We also um, started closing what they call the coverage gap or the donut hole in Medicare. Uh, what that was is when seniors reached their limit on their uh, prescription drug coverage and they wouldn't qualify for catastrophic care, they would go into what we call the donut hole, which is just a gap in coverage where they have to pay out of pocket. For seniors, a lot of them with um, chronic disease, this meant anywhere from four to $6,500 that they did not have and that's the donut hole. We started to close that donut hole and uh, we'll completely close it by 2020, but right now it's at about 50% discounts and we already have 6.1 million people who are receiving $5.7 billion in discounts. Uh, 34 million people on Medicare are getting free preventive service, but also people with privately insured um, coverage, 71 million are getting those preventive services also. So it's not just Medicare and Medicaid, it's everybody with uh, health insurance. And those lifetime limits that I talked about, 105 million Americans have already uh, um, received coverage or have, uh, have continued coverage, I should say, because uh, they're still on their insurance. And I made reference to the Office of Minority Health earlier. Um, I mentioned the program of Medicare uh, for seniors. Remember the care portion of it? Medicaid, the difference between Medicaid and Medicare, and that this is a federal state partnership. And also, a lot of times we say um, um, for families uh, with limited income, and here we say uh, for people, but um, the reason that is is because a lot of times uh, Medicaid is for women and children. So childless adults, if you're a couple that's low income, but if you don't have kids, you don't qualify for Medicaid. If you're a, a single individual, but if you don't have kids, you don't qualify for Medicaid. So there's a caveat there, um, which I'll also refer to later on and the children's health insurance program, because we really see the need for children to have uh, coverage, uh, even if their parents don't qualify for uh, Medicaid. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, um, the things that I mentioned earlier, the 50% discount, the anti-fraud measures, um, the creation of the Innovation Center. Um, the Innovation Center, um, and one of the things that they're doing right now with accountable care organizations, somewhat like a pilot project, and again, under the Affordable Care Act, that looks at the payment models in the healthcare system. 
So you can go see a doctor for something and get treated. You could go back and see the doctor again for the same thing and get treated. And the whole time, it's a, it's, you pay as you get treated. What if you were to pay for whenever your health improves? So instead of just for treatment, it's more on the improvement of the patient. Focusing on the patient and saying, have they been able to manage their diabetes? Is their blood pressure lower now than their previous uh, visit? So looking at a different way of reimbursing for healthcare than the way that we're looking at now. Again, this is just a model right now that we're looking at under accountable care organizations. But this innovation center is looking at that. How can we um, make our healthcare system sustainable and stop this, uh, this uh, spending that's been going on for uh, over five decades? Um, we've streamlined the Medicaid and the CHIP program so that it now is um, all in one application. I'll, re I'll uh, mention this as we talk about uh, the application for, uh, process for the um, marketplace. It's um, one application for, throughout the whole country uh, that will determine eligibility. Um, it would be able to identify uh, Medicaid uh, for individuals that qualify for Medicaid. And it also will coordinate with the marketplace. And I'll go into detail about the difference between uh, both programs. Um, when I talked about the accomplishments, some of the accomplishments also is that now we are, uh, this year is also the first year that we've seen the slowest rate of growth on healthcare spending. Uh, when I talked about the, the premiums and the 80% and 20% that um, insurance companies can use, this is how much was returned to members. $2.1 billion were returned to individuals because uh, a lot of their premiums were not being used appropriately. Rate increases fell. And then on the anti-fraud measures that I mentioned, $4.2 billion in 2012 alone have been recouped just because of our fraud efforts, again, under the Affordable Care Act. So when we talk about health insurance, um, how many of you here are covered by health insurance? Is it student coverage? Is it under employer? Is it because of your parents? It's a mix, right? Um, bottom line is that majority of people have health insurance, 56.2. Um, others, about 20% of the US population is on Medicaid. And when we look at the uninsured, we're looking at 18.5%. We can't make the, the assumption that they're all low income. There are people who are working numerous jobs, but just their employer doesn't provide health care coverage, or it's too expensive to get family coverage. Um, it could be that some small businesses um, just can't afford it because their employees um, may be too high risk, or what insurance companies consider high risk. Which, by the way, women are more high risk than men because we have the ability to reproduce. So, um, so that's a pre-existing condition, by the way. And, uh, and women get charged more. So again, that's before the Affordable Care Act and something that we've changed. But when we look at the 18.5% here and, um, and break that down, we see that 44% of the uninsured is uh, white, non-Hispanic. The largest ethnic group being Hispanic, 32%. Um, African American, 16%. And then it breaks into much smaller numbers um, when we go into uh, other um, ethnicities. One of the challenges that we have when we look at other eth ethnicities, one is uh, they talked about, uh, Melissa mentioned about health literacy, um, understanding what co-pay is, what deductibles are, just understanding how it works is one thing for people who are uninsured or have been uninsured. Um, the other part is language or cultural, uh, cultural barriers that we also uh, need to tackle. In Texas, about 4.9 million of uh, Texans are uninsured. That's about 23% of the population. When you look at how much of that is Hispanic, and again, when I mentioned the challenges in, in uh, reaching out to uh, ethnic communities, we have 3.9 million. 50% of them are uninsured. Um, and undecided on Medicaid expansion, because as you know, Texas did not choose to expand Medicaid. So uh, we have about 3.6 million currently enrolled on Medicaid. 
um, but I'll soon uh, refer to how many people would be able to benefit if, uh, if it were otherwise. Um, more specifics on the young adults, the 26-year-olds that are now enrolled, 357,000 here in Texas. Uh, the pre-existing condition, uh, 9,592 people have benefited. And 92% of the uninsured in Texas qualify for tax credits or Medicaid if Texas were to decide to expand the program. Which, by the way, there is no deadline. I know that the session just ended. But if Texas were to, for whatever reason, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, decide to expand it, um, we would be willing to work with them on doing so. And it could happen very quickly. So again, there's no deadline for the Medicaid expansion. Um, the health insurance marketplace, um, known as the exchanges, as um, uh, the marketplace, <laughs> um, it's a new way to get health insurance. I often get the question of, well, where is the marketplace? Um, the marketplace is more of an online system. Um, it's a way to be able to um, look it up online, compare prices, um, be able to uh, look at, uh, at different plans. And about 25 million Americans are going to be able to tap the system. And we believe that up to about 20 million of them are going to be able to qualify for some of these uh, discounts and, um, and subsidies there. And we know that this is the system that will be able to help working families, those that I mentioned that have several jobs but don't have access to health insurance. Um, as I mentioned, it's an easier way to shop, similar to Expedia or some of these airline um, uh, kayak or uh, whichever kind of um, uh, airline uh, websites where you could pull up different uh, costs or different airlines, look at schedules, look at costs, and then be able to make your decision based on what your needs are. That's uh, somewhat the model that we're using here. Um, one application uh, that individuals or families can fill out, and there they can compare the prices. They could take a look at what, they're, um, what they qualify for, and again, about 90% of the people uh, who are currently uninsured will qualify for some form of discount. And then again, the comparisons. And this is really important because um, there, there are a lot of ways that you could get insurance right now, but here's a way that you'll be able to really compare them and be able to make uh, an informed decision on what it is that your family needs are. Um, this is more for um, a federal or national view of things. So when the Health Care pa uh, Act passed, um, we started working with states, and actually we had started working with states a little before that, to say, here's some federal funding, research uh, your states to find out who are the uninsured, um, what are the insurance companies in your state that would be able to help them, who would be willing to participate in the program. Uh, here's some monies for outreach and education. Start educating your populations about um, the Affordable Care Act, about what's going to be coming down the pike in a couple years. Um, and, and just working with them on developing um, the exchanges is what they were called at the time. So some states said, great, you know, they took the money, started working on it, put together their plans, submitted it to HHS for approval. And those states were referring to state-based marketplaces because they're the states that are moving on and doing the implementation um, uh, completely. Some states agreed to it, said they wanted to, but just wouldn't be able to do it all the way. They needed some help in some form. So those we refer to as state partnership states. And then some states um, actually returned the money and said, we don't want any part of it. Um, and those we are referring to as federally facilitated marketplace because it's the federal government that's going to end up implementing the marketplace. And here we see the result of that. So you have some states, which you'll be hearing about in national news coverage, states like California, Maryland, uh, New York, that are the state-based marketplace. These are the states that are implementing health coverage um, completely and are um, already well underway. Um, because of this, a lot of these states here reserve, received cooperation, leveraged the funds that we send them with local funds, state funding and other kind of uh, foundations, and are able to spend approximately $123 per person that they enroll, 
which means they're really educating their communities, really getting out to them, a lot of uh, news uh, or a lot of uh, uh, paid advertising and so forth to educate their constituencies. Um, these states here are doing a lot of the work on their own and we're helping them with some of the implementation. These are the partnership states. Now these states here, and here's Texas, it are the federally facilitated ones. And these individuals here, because it's only federal funding, each individual's probably getting about $3 of education and outreach or attention uh, because the federal funding has to be split among all these states. So already we start to see vast differences between those that are doing it completely and those that are not. And when I say those that are doing it completely is because there was the Medicaid expansion. So Medicaid expansion was where we raised the ceiling a bit of who qualifies for Medicare and, um, and also where we said, childless adults, you now qualify. Individuals, single adults with low incomes, you now qualify. Um, that was the Medicaid expansion. But remember I told you the difference between Medicaid and Medicare because it's a program that we share with the state the Supreme Court ruled that it's not up to the federal government to make changes to the Medicaid program on eligibility without the state's um, opinion or without their decision on it. And it was with that ruling that these states said we're not expending Medicaid and we're not doing the marketplace. So when we come in to do the marketplace, we could only do the marketplace. We do not have impact on a Medicaid expansion. Is I'm tempted to ask if there are any questions now on that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we'll move along. For the marketplace, eligibility and enrollment, who qualifies? Let me be clear that this is a program for the uninsured. We're gonna learn a lot about this and we're gonna say, hey, this sounds really good, I want some of that. <laughs> but it's a program for the uninsured um, and people who haven't had access to health coverage. Um, again, I, I warned you I was going to be repeating myself on this. Enrollment starts October 1st. It goes all the way till March 31st. This is the first time only after this annually. It'll only be about a three-month enrollment period, but because it's the first time we're going all the way to March. Um, marketplace eligibility, it says in order to qualify, you have to live in the service area. What does this mean? That if I am in Texas and I really like those plans that California is offering, I can't apply for those. I have to apply for the ones that are in Texas. I have to live in the service area. I have to be a US citizen or national, or if a non-citizen, lawfully present in the US for the entire period for which enrollment is sought. And this raises a lot of questions, and so uh, the next two slides, I'll go into more detail on that. Um, but lawfully present also means that if you are an individual who is in the States for a month and the rest of the year you're off Brazil or Italy or some nice place, um, there's no sense for you to, uh, to apply to the marketplace because if you're not here for that entire period, um, it does not make sense. So eligibility does not include you. And you cannot be incarcerated. So, and this is available on our website. So when we look at lawfully present or a non-US citizen, you know, it raises a lot of questions on who. We know that undocumented individuals don't qualify, and that includes the DREAMers, uh, the DACA, the um, uh, young individuals that are um, undocumented. But lawful permanent residents, green card holders are eligible, asylees or refugees. Um, battered spouse, child or parent, victim of trafficking, um, granted withholding of deportation or withholding of removal. Uh, but again, not to be confused with uh, DREAMers, this is more because of the Convention Against Torture. Um, individuals with non-immigrant status includes worker visas, student visas, and citizens of, uh, of the Marshall Islands, uh, temporary, pre uh, temporary protected status temporary protected status, um, and deferred enforced departure, but again, this is DAD, not DACA, which is the uh, DREAMers. Um, again, a lot of different individuals that do qualify even though they are not US citizens. 
So uh, don't make the assumption that if a person is not a citizen that they don't qualify. It's best to look up on the website, look at all the different immigration status, and, um, and, and, and then you can go from there. The application is, uh, has been made very simple. The paper application, this is what it looks like. It's about three pages, uh, five uh, pages for a family, three for individual. And um, we really encourage people to do online, though, because it's just faster processing. Uh, paper application means somebody has to process it. So um, with, with our limited resources, we are asking for online enrollment to be better. And we're going to make this also a lot easier for individuals, too. Similar to online shopping, I'm sure all of you have done some online shopping somewhere. Um, you set up a profile with account, you know, account name, and I'm sure you have to set up a password. So think of your password now that you haven't used before. Um, fill out the online application. You review and compare your options, and then you enroll. Um, this is similar to what I was just saying, that you, you know, filling out the application, then you're going to get all of the different options. You get to compare them, which, and which one's better for you. Uh, and then you pick a plan that's, that's right for you. Um, behind the scenes, however, this is what takes place. You submit your application, and you could do it online. We have a 1-800 number, which I'll share with you also, that you could also do it over the phone, um, by mail. Boo, we don't want mail. <laughs> or in person. Uh, in person, we're going to have a lot of assisters, uh, and I'll go into that uh, detail in a little while. Um, once you submit it, it goes into our data hub, which then verifies and determines eligibility. This is where the system talks to immigration services, it talks to IRS, it talks to Social Security um, Administration, to all of these different federal agencies to confirm eligibility, and then it comes out with, this is what you're eligible for and what discounts you're eligible for. I should also say that when you're online, there's a website chat that you can use in case you have any questions while you're online. And then you enroll for the marketplace, or you're referred to the state for Medicaid program or children's health insurance program. It kind of looks like this. When I talk about the uninsured earlier, when we saw that pie chart of all the uninsured, 54% would qualify for Medicaid, approximately. Um, and this is based on Medicaid expansion, I should point out. So if their federal poverty level is, is less than 138%, and we sometimes use 138%, we sometimes use uh, 133% because there's that uh, flexibility there. Um, that means if you're an individual that makes less than $16,000 a year or a family of four that makes less than $33,000 a year, you would fall into the Medicaid, Medicaid expansion. Now, what happens in states that don't do Medicaid expansion, that means that the cutoff is going to be somewhere around here. And unfortunately for those individuals, um, a lot of it will be staying the same, which means community health centers or emergency rooms or things of that nature. Um, whichever way they're, they're uh, getting their health care now. Other individuals, those that are between the 100 and 400% of the federal poverty level, and we're looking as high as 46,000 for an individual or 94,000 for a family of four. And I believe the Business Journal recently came out saying that the San Antonio median income for a family of four is 51,000, 51,400, something like that. So again, working families, you're looking at this group right here. And because it's based, the marketplace is based on a sliding scale of income and family size, the lower you are here, the more discounts that you'll get as compared to where you are here. About 10% of the uninsured are above this price range. They could still apply to the marketplace, of course, uh, so they could get access to health coverage. but they probably will not qualify for any of the discounts because they make too much. I think that's fair. One of the differences about the marketplace, one of the things that's critical about it actually, is that the plans offered in the marketplace are qualified health plans. And what this means is, let's say right now after this session you go online, you could go online and find insurance coverage, health insurance coverage, and 
a lot of people will want to go for the one that has the lowest premium, and you could find one that's pretty cheap. But if something were to happen, as soon as you walk away from your computer, um, you end up in the hospital, and you may find out that the ambulance on the ride to the hospital was not covered under your insurance. If you stay overnight, a hospital stay was not covered. Maybe the anesthesiologist wasn't covered. Maybe a lot of these other services weren't covered. So what we're securing in the marketplace is that the, oops, sorry, that the plans that we're offering in the marketplace meet the 10 essential services set forth by the Institute of Medicine. What the Institute of Medicine says that individuals need as essential health benefits is what we've screened for. So it also means that the, issu the issuers are licensed by the state and in good standing. So you're not going to get a fly-by-night company that when you need them, you find out they close shop and they no longer exist. Um, it covers the essential health benefits, and I'll go into those in a second. Um, that all these plans are offered by an issuer that offers at least one plan at the silver level and one at the gold level. And this is for um, options, to give people options. And I'll go into the different levels in a bit. And also uh, that this issuer is going to agree to charge the same premium rate, whether it's directly offered through the marketplace or outside of the marketplace. So again, making those comparisons a lot easier. The essential health benefits, these are identified by the Institute of Medicine, ambulatory patient services, emergency services, hospitalization, maternity and newborn care, mental health and substance use disorder services, including behavioral health treatment. Prescription drugs, that's a big one. Rehabilitative and habilitative services and devices, laboratory services, preventive and wellness services, and chronic disease management, also a huge one. And pediatric services, including dental and vision care. Um, there, uh, this is for uh, children. Pediatric dental services may, may be provided by a standalone plan for adults. Um, I mentioned silver and gold. The way that people will be able to see the plans, and I understand that in Texas there are already 54 plans that will be participating in the marketplace. And when I say plans, it's pretty much insur um, insurance companies that are participating in the plans they offer. So let's say if you have employer-covered um, insurance, it could be that your employer is working with uh, Humana or Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they are offering you a basic plan, a I know, Cadillac plan, <laughs> all of these different levels of plans. But that's what uh, plans means. So there is going to be the availability of a bronze, which is the lowest cost one, and silver. And here you get to see what the plan pays on average and then what, uh, what a monthly premium rate would look like. And of course, um, lowest cost being bronze, platinum being the uh, more expensive one. We're also offering a plan, um, or well, let me talk about this first then. Uh, I mentioned about the sliding scale. So your income and family size is gonna be determining the tax credits, the discounts, um, the larger the family, the more the discounts. The lower the income, the more the discounts. Um, some of the, uh, oops, sorry. Some of the income levels and also the eligibility. Um, lower cost sharing. Cost sharing are things like co-pays, so how much you pay out of pocket. Um, and, and this is also for uh, prescription drugs. You have to do a copay when you pick up uh, uh, prescription drugs. Well, we would be able to help with that. That's what we mean by lower cost sharing. Premium tax credits. So the calculation on the premium tax credits is, uh, again, available in the marketplace. Um, and of course, on a sliding scale. So uh, you're looking at, at some of these um, different costs for individuals, for a family of two, this is probably uh, what you're looking at, and then a family of four, 94,200. Uh, 94, these are some of the um, um, ranges there. And then we mentioned also that the tax credits are also available for lawfully residing immigrants. Remember that um, the eligibility of who is eligible for the marketplace. Uh, the cost sharing reductions. Again, like copays, 
um, they're able to lower uh, how much they pay for deductibles, co-payments, and co-insurance uh, through cost-sharing reductions. Again, this is the co-pays when you go see the doctor or when you pick up your prescription drug and some of the uh, um, uh, incomes, uh, which were shown in that uh, chart earlier. Um, and this would be if you enroll in the silver plan through the marketplace, the silver, silver, silver plan um, or uh, above. We also have catastrophic plans. These are catastrophic plans are made with a couple of individuals in mind. Young individuals under 30 who may not want to go see the doctor or need to see the doctor uh, regularly, but we would want them to have insurance. But because they may not see the doctor regularly, this coverage offers three primary care visits and also preventive services with no out-of-pocket cost. So we're looking at young adults Again, 30 years of age. And then also those, the ones that I mentioned that, um, that because there is no Medicaid expansion in Texas, they would be able to go for the catastrophic plan even if they're not under 30 years old. And so these plans are made for uh, limited income and also for um, uh, individuals that may not have as many health needs as others. Uh, the Small Business Health Options Program. Um, I know this isn't the target audience for this discussion, so I'll just breeze right through it, but it's a program that we have for small businesses, again, trying to help small businesses so that they could offer health insurance to their employees. Um, if, if you understand the, the health insurance and how they work with risk pools, is um, if you're a small business and you only have 10 employees, and of those 10 employees, let's say half of them were women that we know are already more expensive uh, because they may go on maternity leave. Or, and then another three or four are elderly or not seniors yet, but older. And it would have been very expensive for that small business to pay for their health coverage um, because you, the risk there it was pretty high. But when you uh, expand that risk pool. So when you're like a Walmart or, uh, or Sam's or Costco or one of these bigger companies, you have more people and you have a bigger mix. And so you don't only have elderly or people with high risk, you also have individuals paying into it that aren't high risk. So that allows the company to negotiate lower rates on the premiums, which is why larger companies can offer um, lower rates on insurance and small companies or small businesses always have a challenge with that. So what we did is we off were offering small businesses incentives where we could pick up 50% of the premium cost if their employees meet uh, certain standards. And this would only be for two years. Um, and again, it's uh, to be able to give the opportunity for everybody to have health, health insurance. Um, the eligible employers can uh, see how much they want to contribute to it. Um, or they can send their employees to the marketplace for them to choose options there. Um, I mentioned earlier about applying online, by phone, by mail, or in person. The 1-800 number, it's right here, 1-800-318-2596. Available 24-7 in 150 languages. Um, you can uh, enroll online. I will say that on October 1st, wait until after 8 a.m. Pacific or uh, Eastern Standard Time. We have to calibrate some uh, systems, and so it, uh, we will be ready to take enrollment uh, after 8 a.m. Um, help in-person enrollment. And let me explain a little bit about these here. Um, Navigators and certified application counselors are pretty much the same thing. They're individuals that took and are taking extensive training, 20 hours or more, to be able to help individuals enroll. The reason why this training, and they have to be certified by HHS, they'll actually get a number and a certification that they have to display. Um, the reason why there's so much sensitivity, one is they have to understand the programs that people qualify for. If they can't answer questions about the Medicaid program or about some of these other programs, um, then they wouldn't be helping too, too much. So um, they have to understand those programs. And then also the sensitivity that they're dealing with personal information, personable or personal identifiable information, 
which means social security numbers, income, things like that, that could be very sensitive and could be uh, exposed to fraud. So uh, we really want to uh, be careful with that. So these individuals here, um, again, extensive training. Now, what distinguishes them from each other is that navigators are individuals that we provided funding to. The federal government provided funding to navigators, so they have a contract with the federal government, if you will, and need to do reports on how they are spending that money, how many people they've enrolled, and so forth. Whereas the certified application counselors did not get any funding and, um, and may not have to do those uh, reports, at least not to us. Um, agents and brokers. Insurance agents and brokers uh, can also take the training, can also enroll individuals. We ask that they be unbiased because we know that they could get commissions from, um, from their own insurance company for how many new customers they bring in. So because we want them to tell people about all the plans, not just their plan, um, they have to sign an agreement that they will be unbiased in presenting all of the different options. Um, and that's how they'll be able to sign up individuals. Other people, educators. When you leave here today, you'll be more informed than the average person. You're considered an educator. You'll be able to tell people this is where you go for information. These are the, uh, the differences between the plans, or this is uh, uh, the way that the marketplace works. Um, we've been doing trainings to, oops, sorry, to librarians, hospital staff, uh, promotores de salud. Um, we also have champions of coverage. Champions of coverage are organizations such as uh, United Way, uh, some um, other uh, um, civic organizations that want to help on being educators and also want people to know that you can go to them for help. And, um, and we have an agreement with them. There's actually a process for them to be approved. And, um, and they, uh, their logo, their name appears on our website and this way when people look up information on our website, they'll see those organizations as being educators, as people who can provide some of the resources and, uh, and would be able to uh, share that knowledge. So again, to apply to be either a certified application counselor or a champion for coverage, uh, you go to our website, uh, marketplace.cms.gov. And actually, you should write this website down because it also has a lot of other information that would be very useful to you. Uh, marketplace.cms.gov, and I'll repeat it again um, in a future slide. I mentioned the different, um, the different ways that people could get help. Navigators, certified application counselors, non-navigator and person assistants that we're calling educators, and agents and brokers. You know, again, what are some of the things that they would need to do? You look at the navigator column. These are all the things that they were contracted to do. Uh, Non-navigator um, also can do a lot of those uh, can do a lot of those things. But again, we really want individuals that uh, are would be able to um, have information on on the different programs. Uh, the certified application counselors, and then again, agents and brokers. Um, I mentioned fraud, and again, we are taking this very, um, very seriously uh, because we know that um, already there are groups out there uh, calling people. We know that there are websites created um, under the names of like healthcare.com or healthreform.com. So if it's com or org, it is not the government website. Our websites are going to end in GOV. Those are the official government websites. Um, so we know that there are people already out there impersonating um, uh, navigators or others. Remember, navigators need to be certified and need to demonstrate that, uh, that certification. Um, reporting fraud, we're working with the um, Federal, um, Federal Trade Commission and also um, with others to take fraud complaints. You can do the fraud complaints through our 1-800 number. And we're also working with, their, with the FTC's complaint assistance. We're doing a, a routing system so that we can make sure to get to these uh, complaints quickly and also refer them to law enforcement. And very important, protecting personal data. Experience we've gotten from the Medicare program. We really need to protect that personal data. Um, which, by the way, uh, if 
by any chance you um, encounter an individual that is afraid to enroll because they think that their information is going to be kept by INS or IRS. Um, it's not kept by anyone. It's just processed through them, but we don't keep that information. And more than anything, empowering consumers with information, because this is the best, um, the best defense, and this is really what's going to help um, get this program uh, implemented, is educating individuals on what their, um, on what their rights and also what their uh, availability is. We have a Spanish language website, cuidadodesalud.gov. Um, our Spanish language website, uh, by the end of October, we'll be able to enroll individuals on the Spanish uh, language website also. Uh, in the meantime, from early, uh, from October 1 until uh, late October, about 28th of October or so, uh, we'll be referring people to the healthcare.gov, which is the main website, um, or they can do the 1-800 number. Um, a lot of the navigators working in Spanish uh, uh, dominant communities uh, are familiar with the healthcare.gov and the English language website uh, or English uh, language uh, uh, enrollment. Again, marketplace.cms.gov. And here you can get training presentations. Uh, you get to see the navigator training also. If you want to see what it is that they're learning, um, you can go on there to, to find out, and um, PSAs, um, videos, any kind of uh, information, resources, or materials. You could print out brochures, pamphlets from there. Um, you could look at some of the uh, news and events that are going on, uh, updates. But this is the website that we refer our partners to, because this way we can share with them everything that's coming out on uh, educating and outreach to individuals. Um, I mentioned the champion for coverage and, um, and some ways that organizations can be champions for coverage. Again, champions for coverage are educators. They're not uh, doing the actual enrollment. They're just out informing people. Um, they would get um, uh, their logo on healthcare.gov and cuidadosalud.gov. Um, a lot of uh, different benefits, but also, more importantly, letting uh, consumers know that they are there so, um, uh, as a resource. So what we really want to do with the Affordable Care Act is to empower individuals by creating that awareness, educating them about what their different options are, um, and really encouraging them to take action and enroll. Um, you've heard before, and I'm sure you'll hear from Dr. Schlenker soon, of the importance of health coverage. You know, and I will say this, when the federal government offered the states Medicaid expansion, um, what I failed to mention was that we said, we will pick up the entire cost of your Medicaid population, 100% of the cost. That's a pretty bold offer. But the reason we were able to do that is because all studies show that people, once they have access to health care, within three years, they start managing their health better. Within three years, you start seeing better health, less cost, um, better family uh, uh, environment, if you will, when they're more educated about managing their health care. And with that, we know that costs start going down. So that's why we were able to offer that, that um, you know, 100% reimbursement. And we said that's for the first two years. After that, it'll be 90%. So even the 90% isn't a bad deal. Um, anyway, that's uh, one of the things that we know is important about uh, health care, is that when people have access to it, they utilize it. And um, that helps the productivity of our country and, uh, and also uh, helps with the cost, as Dr. Schlenker will talk about. We ask you to stay connected. Sign up for text alerts or anything just to, um, just to stay uh, up to date with uh, the different changes, with the different things that are going on. Um, we have a Twitter handle. I can't describe that because I don't know how to do that just yet. Um, <laughs> and healthcare.gov on Facebook. Yes, I'm one of those annoying people on Facebook. There's actually a campaign out by an organization of moms that says uh, they text or they put something on their kids' Facebook page that says, if you sign up for health care, I'll defriend you. <laughs> so it's a way of getting kids to uh, sign up for health care. 
Yeah, you got it, right? <laughs> it's like, ah, that's how it works, yeah. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. I don't know if I take questions now or wait till after Dr. Schlenker. Okay. Um, if there are any questions, yes. Oh, I. Um, there aren't a lot of traditional four-member families anymore. How does it apply to, like, the single parent with one child? Um, my experience in the private sector prior to this was that you could have ten children or one child. As a single parent, you're still in the family um, price range. So is there anything about that that's going to help? Uh, I saw some of some, it, it seems like it is being addressed, um, but I just wanted to ask you, the single parent with one child, where do they fit in? Um, well, the single parent with one child is a family. Um, we uh. do have an individual uh, process. If, let's say, that child is being picked up by the um, um, ex-husband's uh, uh, insurance, and it's just the mother that needs insurance, she could do the single one. Um, but for the family, either way, it's going to be a sliding scale. Oh, it will be. It's an I income see. and family size sliding scale. Uh, okay. So that's what's going to determine. Uh -huh. And then uh, is Texas, you know, some of the states in that big grouping of uh, F, F, F? Federally facilitated, yeah. yeah. Uh, for instance, like Georgia. Right. Um, they were on the news saying, you know, they're going to obstruct in every way they can. And one of the ways they're obstructing is they're not allowing anybody to give exchange information that's not state certified. And so out of, I think, 1,400 applicants for state certification prior to the opening on the first, they've, they've certified one person. Is Texas involved in that kind of thing? Do, does Texas require state certification prior to allowing people to sign them up on the exchanges? Um, I just heard yesterday that, um, and, and this was from unofficial sources, but that uh, Governor Perry is asking for additional training and that um, he was going to ask that um, navigators um, get licensed the way agents and brokers do, which would be somewhere about $450 uh, for each navigator, which, you know, it's not feasible. Uh, in the grant process, in uh, part of this, we did say that states can impose their own certification as long as it does not um, uh, impact the work of the navigators, as long as it doesn't hold them back from being able to perform the work. So I think a lot of that is, is going to be ironed out. Um, and I know October 1st is right around the corner. Um, in the meantime, we have a lot of educators, a lot of organizations, individuals that could uh, refer people. Um, navigators, I think, are going to be used for a lot more of the specific uh, cases where if it's a simple uh, situation, simple um, environment, individuals can do it online on their own. Um, it's, we've really simplified the, uh, the enrollment process so that it can be done uh, without a lot of confusion. But we do know that there are a lot of special cases uh, mixed families and such, uh, where navigators are going to be needed. Uh, and two more quick ones, is that okay? Um, the next one is uh, another thing that's happening are many people, particularly in the, big, in the big group of the states, you know, their way of scamming the system is to be cutting the hours of people so that they fall below. Um, uh, but it seems like from what I gleaned from your presentation today, they, those people that have lost hours so that their employers don't have to provide coverage, well, it seems like they'll still have a venue to seek coverage under the exchanges, huh? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Or the um, expanded Medicaid. Right, mm -hmm. and, and this, is, this is the law for everybody to have health coverage. Um, and, and I failed to mention the penalties, and so I'll address that also. But So everybody has to have health coverage. Um, if your employer denies you health coverage and, uh, and cuts your hours and you don't qualify for the employer-sponsored uh, coverage, then you could go to the marketplace and get it there. I will say that, um, on, on the contrary, one of the things that we're uh, experiencing are individuals who have employer-covered insurance 
who don't want their employer covered insurance and want to be in the marketplace. Because if you are, let's say, the receptionist at your company and make a certain money a year, and your employer um, insurance offers these plans, you could pick the same plan that your CEO picks, who makes four times your salary, and both of you are paying the same premium. But if both individuals go to the marketplace, that receptionist is going to get assistance because it's a sliding scale based on income and family size. So it's going to be a lot cheaper for her, and that CEO is going to be paying much less than the receptionist. So again, um, we're facing the contrary, which is a lot of individuals are saying, can I opt out of my employer covered insurance and go to the marketplace, which um, it, that's not an option. The marketplace is for individuals who haven't had insurance, who don't have insurance, don't have access to insurance. So if you already have Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, this is not a program for them. And then the other thing is, um, although the tax credits are helpful, um, many people are below this, below the income level where they're having to pay taxes. So I guess that would then put them in the Medicaid pool. Right, in the Medicaid pool, um, and the tax credits are actually very helpful. The, the subsidies are, um, I think, um, I, I believe it was the Business Journal that came out and said what some of these costs are, are going to be approximately. Um, and a lot of them are under $100 for a monthly premium. So then, they are going to be very helpful. Just, and um, and mm -hmm. I said that I was going to mention the penalties, and then I didn't. Um, so the first year penalty is very low. It's $95 per person, um, and that's the first year, a year. Um, it is very low. It could be up to $265 for family. Um, but they're expected to go up, and by 2016, it will be something like $65. Um, and it's not, it, it's, it isn't so much about penalizing the individual. There is a penalty because this is a law and you should adhere to the law. But it's more about not getting health insurance is accepting the reality that we're in right now, which is emergency room cost, expenses, rising premiums, rising health care cost. So here's a, chain, here's a chance to reverse that. So that's why it isn't so much about penalizing people. It's more about encouraging people to, uh, to get on on board and get health insurance coverage. And just the last um, uh, point I wanted to make, it, in the prescription drug coverage, it seems like that's sort of something that's not really being addressed and it is skyrocketing, like 400% on some generics and uh, uh, pres um, brand names in the last, say, two to three years, 400% increases. So it seems as though, I'm not sure how to, it, from a business sense, figure this out, but it's wonderful to have people coverage, but then if the drug costs are still not affordable, that's a whole other they, arena. They, they haven't been, and they are part of, of this package. So um, if you sell a product and you know that in two years this product is going to be impacted and you're going to have limits on this and that and stuff, you're going to try to make the most money in those two that's years. That's what they're doing. I see. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us today. Um, two questions Thanks that I might have to wait until everything is actually rolled out, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Um, so on the different packages, the plans from um, bronze up to, to what is it, uh, gold, you, you talked about the deductibles and then you talked about the actual um, out-of-pocket copay. Um, is there also a difference in services provided under those different packages or is it the same services? Excellent question. Um, the catastrophic and the bronze plan, um, once you meet your deductible, then um, all those 10 essential health benefits kick in. Um, but until that time, it's more of just access to, um, to lower cost. Um, those plans, uh, particularly the, the catastrophic plan, um, it does not qualify for the tax credits because it's already low cost. It's already very, uh, very low cost, actually, um, for individuals. Um, uh, the bronze plan uh, does qualify for the tax credits and so forth. Um, I, I, but then in terms of services, so if I sign up for the gold plan, am I going to get more services than somebody who signs up for the bronze plan? Different services or are all the services the exact same? Oh, okay, good question. Um, right, the, the higher the plan, the more, um, I don't know, uh, whether it's services, uh, bigger network, 
Um, it's very similar to the private sector right now, which actually this is the private sector. So it's very much the bronze plan is the basic plan and the platinum plan is the Cadillac plan. So yes, you will have, uh, uh, it will be more expensive. Uh, it will have more of the services. Um, it's up to people to choose which one. Some people may choose based on their doctor belongs to a certain network and he's in the silver plan network or he's in the platinum plan network or you know, um, in the bronze plan network. So again, uh, yes, there are gonna be a variety of services under the difference plan, the different okay. plan and, being the more basic. And that last point was the, my second question, which was so, so it's not necessarily just a different package of services, but also the breadth of the wet network that you have available because what we've recently seen in the last day is the information coming out about the narrow networks associated with the bronze and the silver plans, particularly here in the state of Texas. And in one of your slides, you mentioned that if somebody goes on the marketplace, what they'll find there will be the same price and the same services as what they would find on the actual market outside of the marketplace. For that plan, for that specific plan. But if I'm on Blue Cross Blue Shield right now, I can access our UHS services, but Blue Cross Blue Shield will not provide that service on the marketplace. So I'm, I'm curious about that disconnect because it sounded like in your presentation you said they would be the same, but... It, right. Maybe I the misunderstood. Plans, the plans that are in the marketplace will be available outside of the marketplace. Now, what you're asking is if the plans outside of the marketplace will be available inside the marketplace, and that's not which the is case. not the case. Right. Yeah. But there will be narrower networks within the marketplace at the lower level of plans. Is that the kind of idea? Um, I, I believe that's the okay. general idea. I, okay. As in most plans, the basic option is is pretty basic. And once you go up in scale, you get more, um, yeah, more options. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm concerned about the very low income who may qualify for catastrophic. But if they want to and perhaps can budget in to buy something like a bronze, how, how does that work if their income is below that qualifying level to receive the discount? When in, in the process, you will have the option to purchase even if, you, um, even if your in income does not meet that. So let's say if, um, if I have a, um, a sibling that is uninsured because whether very low income or not working or something like that, I could buy it for them. Like when they fill it out, it'll show they're so low income that this is where they qualify for certain plan or whatever, um, that doesn't mean they don't have the option to buy the others. Um, so yeah, so they'll be able to purchase it if they wish. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. It does, okay. thank you. And, and I should point out that particularly in Texas where the Medicaid expansion was not uh, done, that those individuals who cannot afford a uh, marketplace uh, or the catastrophic plan um, and don't qualify for Medicaid, uh, that because of their situation, we call that a hardship, uh, where, um, or, and that is an exemption to the penalty. So individuals who do not qualify just because um, of the situation that, that uh, the state has imposed on them will not be penalized. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Um, as far as selling the plan, I'm pretty sure it'd be easy to get it across to most of the people because it would fall under the low income ranges. Uh, but where most of the opposition comes from is people in the middle. You know, those people that are like, you know, they kind of hit the 90s, 50s, 80s. And uh, in order to convince them, I know they got uh, credits and, you know, tax benefits. But is there anything tangible I could tell them, you know, since they are the biggest opposition? I mean, what can I actually give them that solid? There's, um, there's actually um, a calculator, and, and um, uh, I believe there's a calculator on healthcare.gov. I know that Kaiser Family Foundation has one, and we will um, definitely be having a calculator if it's not there uh, yet, um, but that could uh, determine some of those expenses. One of the things that you can use as a baseline, which unless you're good at math, which I'm not, um, you could turn around quickly, is that health insurance um, should not or... Uh, should not cost more than 9.5% of your annual income. So that's a, a good stat to keep in mind uh, in, if you want to quickly do the math. Um, and so even if you are covered by your employer, 
if the insurance that your employer offers is more than 9.5% of your annual income, gross, yes, you can go to the marketplace because what your employer is offering you is too expensive and you can't get it. Now what happens in those cases is that the employer will be penalized for all the employees they have that end up going to the marketplace because they're not offering affordable health insurance. And since they don't want to be penalized because their penalties are a lot heftier than $95 per person, a lot of employers are now looking at, and, and uh, many of them asked for the one-year extension, are looking at how they could reduce their, uh, their cost of health insurance to their employees. Um, in your case, with, or what you're asking about, um, I think the calculator would be helpful. Uh, Dr. Schlenker is going to actually do some, um, some examples. He went down the calculator and put different scenarios. I saw his presentation yesterday. Um, so, um, so maybe that will help to be able to say a range. Um, but there are some, um, again, some very low cost uh, options available because of the subsidies and the tax credits. Thank you. Uh, so this might be related to the 9.5% rule that you were just talking about, but I think I read somewhere that if you make, so supposedly your health care, the cheapest health care that you can get on the exchange costs more than 8% of your income, you can actually be exempt. What are we, is that true? And what do we do with those people that are exempt from being enrolled in health care if they really like they can't afford it and since we aren't expanding here in Texas we can't catch those people on Medicaid. Yeah, um, Unfortunately um, one is they won't be penalized um, but unfortunately um, they'll be they'll continue to get their health care if they're getting any health care right now uh, through the same means. Uh, many of them go to community health centers that have a sliding scale and you pay up front um, and um, many wait until they're um, in a situation that lands them in the emergency. Fortunately, that's, um, yeah, that, that's. Okay, so uh, with, we have CareLink in Bear County. That's still gonna be around and that can potentially be something that these people could work with. Um, I'm not familiar with CareLink if it is a program or if it is health insurance. If okay. it is just a program, then um, it, it is not considered health coverage. Um, because health coverage, you want to have the essential health benefits. So if it's just a program, it's not considered health coverage, and uh, you want to get a health plan. Um, so I'm, I'm not familiar with what CareLink is. Yeah, it's a, it's a program. Um, but my last question, so I know you're really pushing the online enrollment. Um, is the government doing anything to make sure that these people have access to you know, the online applications and that kind of thing? Because it's one thing to say, hey, sign up online, that's great. But, you know, if you can't afford health care, I wonder how much these people can afford internet access and a computer. Um, I think one of, the, well, one of the reasons why I showed that stat of who, who are the uninsured is um, because a lot are working families. And, um, and um, yes, there is going to be low income. And I think there are a lot of, you know, uh, assumptions made that people who don't know uh, how to use the internet or don't have access to computers. But um, a, lot of, a lot of the uninsured are also working families, people with small businesses and so forth. Um, but as far as uh, in your question, um, that's, what, that's why we're training librarians and we're uh, working with the libraries throughout the country that you could go to your library and someone will be there to help you with the computer to, uh, to be able to do that. Um, the website chat so that while you're online you could get uh, your questions answered while you're on there. Um, the navigators are also um, uh, helping with online as well as the uh, uh, consumer assistance. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. I have a quick question. Um, so uh, if you actually qualify for Medicaid, I know there's a lot of people who qualify for Medicaid who actually don't apply for it. If you go on the online exchange, would it tell you that uh, you actually qualify for Medicaid rather than, you know, getting health insurance? Is that part yes. of it? Yes, okay. that was that eligibility part. It would tell you, you know, you qualify for Medicaid and, um, and, and this is, uh, and their processing would then take on a different route than the marketplace. And just one more thing I want to really confirm. Uh, if you're between 100%. You know, let, me, let me just say okay. you're absolutely right. There are a lot of people currently who qualify for Medicaid who are not enrolled, uh, whether uh, due to a stigma or maybe just not aware of their eligibility. Um, but now that everyone is required to have health insurance, 
we really hope that they'll be able to sign up easily and uh, be able to get that health coverage that they've been eligible for. Mm -hmm. So uh, just one thing I want to confirm, if you're between 100% and 133% of income in Texas, I mean, you don't qualify under the Medicaid expansion, would you actually be able to, if you choose to, to use the exchanges and get the insurance? Is that, okay, cool. Um, Thank you. You're welcome, yeah. Um, and, and also the catastrophic plan is for individuals like that in mind. Even though you're, if, even if you're not under 30, you could, uh, because you fall in that, uh, in that um, uh, range of hardship, you could uh, apply for the catastrophic also. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you again for coming. Um, because smoking is one of the few criteria that will um, cause you to have a higher premium, um, how is smoking status verified by the system? Um, that's a good question. And actually, that was just brought to my attention um, yesterday, that, um, that uh, smoking is not a protected group. It's not like, let's say, you know, male, female, or ethnic group, right? It's, uh, so because of that, insurance companies can charge more to, to smokers. Um, and it, it's not a protected group under the law. And it's my understanding that that's already happening to where their premiums are, are more um, than non-smokers. Um, where um, it gets confirmed or verified, um, that is a, a good question. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and also, uh, right now that I just said confirmed and verified, I should also point out that a lot of this is going to come out in the wash at tax time, because it's when you file your taxes that um, you're, um, you're going to have to prove that you have health coverage. Uh, so employers are going to be distributing letters to their employees showing that they have health coverage. So at tax time, not only do they have their W-2, but also a form that says they have health care coverage. Um, and um, so that'll be something new at tax time that you'll have to present. And if you don't have that and you don't uh, fall in that hardship level and um, tax preparers know what your income level is from the information you provide, um, then that's where the penalty will, will kick in. I have a quick question about the networks. Um, is there any regulation in place to make sure that the networks aren't too small, um, even in the smallest plans, or from a provider standpoint, are there any incentives for providers to become part of the networks? Um, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. Um, the, uh, one of the things that, um, that I can tell you, it doesn't really answer your question, but the um, federally qualified health centers are part of the networks. Um, I, I don't know how small is too small in regards to network or what, what you think small or too small is, um, but not that I know of as far as the requirement. Gentlemen, unfortunately, that was the last question. We're out of time for questions. Well, let, me just take, let me just take here. Sure, we'll take the last one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've talked a lot about income being a uh, prerequisite for these different plans. But what about people that have been uh, displaced from work and decide to go back to school and maybe don't have the income, but they have a net worth? How is that going to be affected in the healthcare market? Um, they can purchase the health insurance. So, so they have to, instead of being able to live off their net worth, going to school to further their education, they'd have to expend that with the health care? Uh, yes, or they would be not reporting income at tax time um, or would show that they have no income and then they would um, qualify for that hardship waiver. Um, thank you very much for your uh, time and attention. All right. So, Ms. Nino, thank you again very much for your time and for uh, the information you've brought to us, and thank all of you for your questions. At this point, we're getting ready to have a very short break. Um, before we do so, though, I've been asked by our monitoring and evaluation committee, if all of you would do us a favor, when you look in your registration packet that you received, you should notice that you have an orange sheet with a QR code. If you have a smartphone, we would ask you to please go ahead and scan that, uh, or if not, 
visit the uh, website that you have a URL for and just take a very brief pre-assessment survey just to kind of get a feel for where we are now. And as we go on later throughout the day, we'll also do some additional assessment. It's my very great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Thomas Schlenker, who is the Department Director uh, and Health Authority for the San Antonio and Bear County here uh, at the San Antonio Metro Health District. Dr. Schlenker has received his BA from Antioch College and received his medical degree from Northwestern, as well as a master's in public health from Harvard and was trained in pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. Dr. Schlenker's practiced general and hospital-based pediatrics in, in uh, Latin America, including a year as a senior Fulbright fellow at the National Institute of Public Health in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Subjects of his published research include the epidemiology of measles, hepatitis A, immunizations, childhood lead poisoning, infant mortality, and how to influence physician practice. Areas of his concentration since becoming Director of Metro Health in uh, 2011 have included teen pregnancy, obesity, syphilis, and neighborhood health strategies. We're very glad to be able to have Dr. Schlenker here with us today, and I'd like to ask you to help me welcome him to our presentation. Thank you, Dr. Yep. Thank you very much. Great to see you all here uh, today. Uh, thank you for coming. You are doing something very important. And um, for those of you that are students, doctor, nurse, dental, pharmacy, other allied health personnel, um, probably every single one of you is in school now because someday you want to make a difference. And sometimes that's frustrating to be a student and think that, well, I do want to make a difference, but it's some time in the future. And well, that's the way it goes. You've got to learn how to do it first. But this actually is an opportunity for you to make a difference right now. And I uh, recognize you and, and applaud you for, for seeing that. Um, my talk here is, is similar to Teresa's that you heard this morning, but hers more big picture, more content oriented, mine hopefully more practical and focused on Bear County and San Antonio and focused on you specifically as an individual and as an organization, what you can do to help the couple hundred thousand people in Bear County who do not have health insurance get health insurance. That's the whole point of my talk, is what can you do? And hopefully this will give you some ideas and some tools, and you'll know uh, how to proceed. So just a little review from this morning. Uh, the Affordable Care Act is the law in the United States. It was passed by both houses of Congress in 2010. It was signed by the president. It was review, review, reviewed in 2012 by the Supreme Court and confirmed. Uh, and it has been partially implemented now for three years. And many good things have happened because of it over and during that three year period. And you've heard about some of them already this morning. Uh, kids can keep on their, their uh, family health insurance through 26 years of age. That's helped me a lot, I know, personally, and for two of my boys. Um, health insurance is required now and has been since 2010 that they cannot spend less than 80% of the premium they collect on health care because many of them were spending a lot less than that so that they could hike up the salaries of their executives and go on expensive conferences and stuff like that. Um, there's been uh, a great deal of uh, attention paid to fraud that unfortunately is within our healthcare system and that has been enforced and a couple billion dollars has been collected from fraudulent companies. Some of you may have read in the paper where a company in New Braunfels that makes these little electric scooters recently filed for bankruptcy because they had been cheating us all over the years, selling scooters to people who didn't need, it, need them through Medicaid um, and arranging fraudulent transactions to boost their bottom line. Well, they finally got caught, um, so that's a good thing for all of us. 
Um, and overall, and I think Teresa mentioned this already, for the first time in 50 years, the rise of health care costs in the United States has been going down. So that is something very new, and that has only been in the last couple years. So what you hear, that Obamacare is a failure, that it's the end of the world, that it's a train wreck, uh, <laughs> it couldn't be farther from the truth, in part because it hasn't been fully implemented yet, but also in part because the parts that have been implementing have been working pretty darn good so far, and we need to uh, know that. Um, what I want to focus on today, well, and then as you know, the Texas legislature this session decided not to expand uh, Medicaid coverage to 138% of poverty. Personally, I think that's unfortunate, but that's the way it is at the moment. Uh, that can change in the future, hopefully it will. But at the moment, it's very unfortunate because those people who are under 100% of poverty level, the poorest among us, if they don't have Medicaid now, um, th there is no recourse for them, and the marketplace is not going to help them. And that is sad news to deliver, but we have to be honest if, when uh, we encounter those people who are that poor and say, really, nothing has changed for you, unfortunately. Um, but the marketplace is a way for people above 100% of poverty to get health insurance if they don't now. And that's what we want to focus on today, and specifically how can that, will that happen here locally. And last of all, what does Obamacare have to do with Ciclovia? Absolutely nothing at all. But I, I wanted to bring it up because Ciclovia is tomorrow. <laughs> it's a giant party on Broadway, and you're all invited to it, and it's free. So I hope to see you all there. Um, some conceptual things. Why do we even need to change our health care system? Well, for a lot of very important reasons, it needs to be changed and reformed. One, millions of people are uninsured in the United States and have no decent access to health care. I think it's about 40 million people. In general, even though we're the richest country in the world, we have pretty poor health outcomes. Um, we're not the healthiest country in the world by any stretch. This over here is a map of obesity in the United States. The darkest colored states are states where obesity is 35% of the entire adult population. That has been getting worse and worse and worse over the last 30 years. So clearly our healthcare system is not doing a real good job on this risk factor for cardiovascular disease, for diabetes, for stroke, for so many other things that are filling up our hospital beds now. It's not working. So that's a really important reason. There's waste, there's unnecessary and harmful care in our system, and there's excessive profit. And we have talked about a few of those things. And it's just too expensive. Even though we are the richest country in the world, we can't even afford it anymore. Here's how we compare with other countries. Every blue dot is a different country on this map. And this compares the cost per person per year of health care in all these different countries on the horizontal axis on the bottom. It goes from $1,000 to $8,000 here along the bottom. And then the vertical axis is the uh, average lifespan of people who live in each country. And that goes from 72 years up to 84 years. Now, the first thing you notice about this graph is that everybody's kind of clustered in the middle there. So, and you might not be able to read that. Those countries are abbreviated, but you've got Germany, Denmark, Sweden, France, Finland, um, Luxembourg, Japan, Canada, Australia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Every developed country in the world is clustered right there in the middle. Now, what's the second thing you notice about this graph? <laughs> There's a little dot. There's a little dot way over here. What is going on there? Well, unfortunately, that's the United States. And what this shows is that all of these countries, oh, I've got a laser printer here. Let me use that. All of these countries here, 
spend about $4,000 a year on health care. Some a little more, some a little less, but on average about $4,000 per year per person on health care. The United States spends almost $8,000 per year, twice as much as any other country in the world. And it's a, some good questions are why. We won't go into that today. We don't have enough time. But the clear fact, and this is not in dispute, is that it is twice as expensive here in the United States as it is in any other developed country in the world. If you want to have a baby in Germany, it probably costs you three or $4,000. If you want to have a baby in the United States, it's going to cost $8,000. If you get a hip replacement in Australia, it'll probably cost you maybe $5,000. If you get a hip replacement in the United States, 10000 or more. Um, so that's not a real good system is, as far as I can tell. And then, oops, sorry, and then on the vertical axis, this is what we get for our health care expenditure. Um, we, this, this is one measure of health, how long people live. In these countries here, they live about maybe on average 81 years or so. In the United States average is 78. So we spend twice as much and we get less. Now that is not a good business deal. And um, however, even if you think this is fine, you're okay with that, look at this. This is the amount of money that's spent in the United States in total year by year. The, the most recent year I have is 2009, but now in 2013 we're up close to three trillion dollars a year. And this is the biggest industry in the United States. It's bigger than automobiles, bigger than oil, bigger than anything. Healthcare is the biggest industry in the United States. Three trillion dollars a year, close to 18 percent of our gross national product. As you see, it's going up and up and up and up and up twice as much as any other country in the world expends. This is just not sustainable. This cannot go on. And so that is um, one thing that's pushing change in the healthcare system. But um, what we want to focus on today is a small part of all the change that's needed, which is the Affordable Care Act marketplace. I heard some of the questions that came up before. It should be clear to everybody that Obamacare is not going to solve all the problems, not even going to get close to all the problems, but I think it is a good step in the right direction, and the fact that 200,000 people in Bear County don't have health insurance needs to be addressed, and that will begin as of next Tuesday, and that's why we're all here. But here are some basics about health insurance, because a lot of people don't really understand what insurance is all about, especially if you're somebody like myself, who throughout their entire life has gotten health insurance through their job. You don't really have to think about it too much, and you don't really know how much it costs. Um, but the biggest reason, I mean, the one point that's really important to make about health insurance is it's not free. This is, it costs, but, and, and a lot of people need to hear that right off the bat. We're not talking about Medicaid or Medicare. This is not government health insurance. These are, these are commercial policies from commercial insurance companies, and they cost. The problem was that before the Affordable Care Act, it wasn't even realistic, the cost, for many people. Not all, but for many people. Now, why do you even need health insurance? Well, the biggest reason is for major medical expenses or catastrophic care. If you would have a serious injury or illness that would send you into the system, you could end up bankrupt. And it still is the most common reason for bankruptcy in the United States, our health care costs. A friend of mine is sitting in the audience today. Her daughter in college had to go to the emergency room uh, and her bill was $3,000, and that was like for two hours in the emergency room. And nothing was really wrong with her. But if something had been, 
That could be 10, 20, 50,000 hospitalization. It could wipe you out financially, your family out financially, and it does happen every day. And that's probably the main reason why everybody needs health insurance. Um, in the past, though, if you had a pre-existing condition, it may have been impossible for you to get health insurance. Um, for example, if, if you uh, lost your job for some reason and you were a diabetic and needed a lot of ongoing care and you lost your insurance with your job and then you knew you had substantial medical needs and expenses so you went out and tried to buy an insurance policy and you were either willing and able to pay for it which is not cheap to begin with in the commercial market most likely you would have been refused you can't buy one we're not going to sell it to you because it's a bad business proposition. We know we're going to lose money on you because you have a pre-existing condition. Also, in the olden days that are not quite over yet, if you're a woman, that's considered a pre-existing condition because you might get pregnant and have a baby. So the insurance company might deny you coverage or they might say, well, you can have coverage, but we won't cover a prenatal care or a birth. Or we will, but it'll cost you extra. So if you're a woman, you automatically get charged more than a man. Now that might be a good business decision, but it's really not fair. But that's the way it is. Um, adjusted rates. Depending on who you are, you may have to pay a different rate. Um, your, your rates will go up as you get older, and, and that kind of makes sense. Their rates are different from state to state, and that has to do with more of the business market competition, and that probably is not going to change either. Um, the premiums, the co-pays, and the deductibles, insurance is, is structured so that you pay a certain amount of money each month, and that protects you for whatever the standards of the policy are. But then if you actually use any service, you're probably going to have to pay something for it, and that's not going to change. Um, how much will change, but not the fact that you have to pay. If you go to the pharmacy to get some medicine, you're probably going to have to pay $5 or 10 or 20 depending on your uh, plan. If you go to the emergency room or the hospital, you will have to pay a portion of that. That's basically how insurance works. And that's not going to change, but the money part of it will. Um, the benefits. This has always been a huge problem and continues today because if you just go out on the street and buy an insurance policy you can get a really good deal you can get an insurance policy for about thirty dollars a month so great what's the problem well the problem is you don't really know what you're buying and um, even if you read the entire policy which most people don't there's all these small prints and things that are hard to understand and most people don't realize what their insurance policy covers until, until they get sick or injured. They go to the hospital or the emergency room, and then afterwards they get a bill, and they, they find out, oh, that wasn't covered under the policy. So it's kind of like hidden from us. And that's a big problem. Frequently in the past, it, 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 it is the, was the case, and it still is the case today, that... Um, if you're really sick or you really need help, that's when your insurance policy says, sorry, <laughs> you're not covered for that. Um, and then there's the cost of it. In insurance, if you don't get it through your workplace, is pretty darn expensive. If you're a completely healthy young person, 27, 28 year old, uh, you're probably going to have to still pay three or $4,000 a year for a health insurance policy at a minimal level. If you're older or if you have a family, we're talking 10,000, 12,000, or even more. So it's, a, it's very expensive if you don't get it through your work. And I think um, today's surprise shared the, the, the uh, slide with you this morning that about half of people in the United States do get it through their work, but the other half don't. So that's a lot of people. So that's pre-ACA, now we're going to talk about what's post-Affordable Care Act. It's still not free, okay? You do have to pay for this. However, now it will be fair and it will be affordable. 
It will still cover catastrophic illness or injury. But one difference is that there will be no upper limit. And many people who have had serious problems in their family, like a child gets leukemia and over a few years has to get treatment after treatment after treatment, on a regular commercial policy, they may find that once they reach half a million dollars, they're done. They have no more coverage. If you have breast cancer that recurs, let's say, or requires extensive treatment, you may reach your upper, li upper limit on their policy and then you're stuck. That is no longer legal. And insurance policies through uh, the marketplace will have no upper limit. You, as long as you're sick, and injured, you will be able to get the care you need. Pre-existing conditions are refusal to accept people with pre-existing conditions are outlawed. And we can talk more about that if you like. Adjustable rates, you don't have to pay any more just because you're a woman. But it's still, it is adjusted by age. It still is adjusted by family size. That kind of makes sense. Um, premiums, co-pays, and deductibles. Still, the system will be the same. But for example, if you um, have to go to the emergency room, you will have to pay something. And it's usually in the range of two or $300, which is a lot of money. But it's not two or $3,000 or $10,000. So it, it won't break the bank the way it had in the past. Benefits, and this is the best part. The benefits are exactly the same. And they, every single policy that's offered in, uh, on the marketplace has, has to cover those 10 essential benefits that Teresa showed you this morning, emergency room, doctor's outpatient visit, uh, hospitalization, drugs, uh, the entire list. It's all the same. You don't have to read the fine print. There is no fine print. It's all the same. The only difference is the cost. So if you buy the cheaper policy and you go to the emergency room, uh, you, you might have to pay a $200 copay. Instead of that, you might have to pay a $500 copay, whatever. You decide how much you want to pay in premium versus how much you want to pay as a copay. For example, even in the bronze plan, um, all of those things are covered, but uh, you have to pay full price if you want a mammogram. You have to pay full price if you want a colonoscopy. So for who would the bronze pan, plan be a good choice for? Probably most of the people in this room because you're young. None of those screening tests are appropriate for you anyway. So you, you're not most likely going to need them. So, but you, you have to decide based on your age, based on your family, based on your uh, general health condition. And then the cost of the plan. When someone signs up for a marketplace pan, plan, they will see how much the commercial cost is. And that will be the same as it was before. If you're, you know, if you're a family of four or five, it's, it's probably going to be in the twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 a year range. And, but then you'll be able to see how much subsidy you will get to uh, offset that cause, and that depends on your income. The lower your income, the more subsidy you get. And the hope is that this then will be affordable for just about everybody. Um, so scoping it down to our situation here, in Texas there are about 6 million people who are uninsured. So that is a lot of people. I think we're the highest in the nation in terms of percentage. Um, if the Medicaid expansion had gone through, um, that would have taken care of these two rows here. Um, so that was a lot of people, and that's not going to happen now. However, with the marketplace, that's the first two rows here, you can see that that's about half, I would say, of the, the total. So. It's not perfect because the Medicaid expansion didn't happen, but it definitely can help a lot of people and will help a lot of people if we do our job correctly. 
This first line says marketplace with help. So these are people who are eligible for the marketplace and will get a subsidy uh, so that the uh, premium is more affordable. The second line is marketplace at full cost. So they can also get uh, insurance through the marketplace, but they have to pay full price. Now, who would want to do that? Who, who would want to pay full price through the marketplace? What? Right, right, yes. Um, but I'm trying to focus on the difference between getting a discounted policy through a federal subsidy and someone who would just spend the $13,000 out of their pocket. And I guess what I'm looking for is the person that would do that is somebody with a pre-existing condition. They would be willing probably to pay anything because they have been denied insurance and now they can get it. So if, if they can afford it, they'll just pay it and they do have this opportunity. But most, as you can see, would get a substantial uh, subsidy from the government. So what about here in Bear County? As you know, the marketplace is available for all those who earn between 100% of the federal poverty level for income and 400%. So does anybody know what the FPL, federal poverty level, for a single individual is? Outer. 7,000. No, it's 11,500. So if you make, as an individual, over 11,500, you are eligible. And that goes up to 400% of that. So p individual, single people who make up to $45,000 a year are eligible and will get some amount of subsidy, although the less you make, the more you get. Now, for a family of four, the federal poverty level is about $24,000. And that goes up to over $90,000. So we're not talking about poor people. Uh, this is like a lot of people. People from quite poor all the way up to very, very solidly middle class. And this graph shows the um, blue colored segments are 100% of poverty, 200% of poverty, and 300% of poverty up to 400%. As you can see, this is the majority of Bear County. So you walking down the street, most of the people you see will be eligible for the marketplace. So keep that in mind. This is a lot of people, and it's a big variety of people. Um, also, unfortunately, those below 100% are not eligible, and they're kind of out in the cold. That's the way it is at the moment. Those above 400% are not eligible either, because presumably they don't need the help. So there are um, approximately 931,843 people who comprise these segments of the population. If they have the same rate of uninsurance as the entire county, which we happen to know, making that assumption, that's 23%, then there are a total of 214,323 people in Bear County who do not have health insurance and who are eligible for the marketplace and can get it. So that is our challenge. How many of those folks can we help? Can we talk to them about insurance, help them decide if they're eligible, point them in the right direction, and kind of help them get started? That's the challenge. And just think, if you're a medical student or a dental student or a nursing student, Three, four years from now, you'll be out in practice seeing patients. What if you come across somebody who you helped get insurance, and then years later, you see him as a patient? That would be pretty special, and I'll bet it's going to happen. So what can you do, what can we do to help people figure out if they're eligible and then get them, help them get insurance? Well, I mean, if you're an insurance agent, you can do that, and people can still go through their insurance agent to make it happen. Um, there are navigators and certified application counselors. These are people 
who go through a specific training, which is about 30 hours. It can all be done online. It is free. Um, but then you, you, it, they uh, are connected with one or another kind of agency uh, that it might be a hospital, healthcare system, um, a church, uh, whatever, uh, where they can help people uh, in that um, constituency get insured. Um, if anybody in this room would like to become a certified application counselor, like I said, it's free. It's doable. It, you can do the whole thing online. You go through several modules, and at the end, you take a test. If you pass the test, then you're certified. You get hooked up with an agency. And then you don't get paid for this. This is voluntary. But if you want to, if this is one of the ways you want to give back through your church or through the Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA, um, then you can do this. And I would encourage you. But most of the people, in the audience today, what we're hoping is that we all become champions, which is the bottom category here. And, and these are folks that just take the time and make the effort to learn enough about the Affordable Care Act to guide people in the right direction, like we're talking about. And that could be, in my opinion, the most important thing, because probably most people are going to be able to enter onto the official government website on a computer and figure this out for themselves, choose a policy for themselves. I believe it's going to be easy enough that most people will be able to do that. So the big challenge then is just to get those people aware that this is an opportunity they have and get them to the right place at the right time. So that's what we are, are really concentrating on. However, um, the champions, the people in this room, need to be located somewhere. So another thing that the city is, of San Antonio is doing is trying to establish uh, sites all around the community. Now there will be sites out here connected with hospitals and medical clinics that are associated with your various programs. And those are good. Those are good. So you need to find out about those. And we will try to put those on the city's website too. But in addition to that, there will be city libraries. There will be community centers. There will be other sites in town that will have uh, a spot, uh, a couple of computers, some information that is available to anybody who walks in the door who wants to get health insurance. And then if you or others can be there to kind of help in that process, um, then I think it's going to work really good. Uh, so that's what this is all about. Why don't we, why don't we take a break and discuss, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, interaction here. If there are 200,000 people or more in Bear County that would be eligible for the marketplace, who are they? Let's describe some of those people. Um, oh, well, wait a second. Hey, I'm missing a few slides here. That's too bad. Um, So um, let's do this. Tell me somebody, yourself, somebody in your family, a friend, or maybe just somebody you imagine who, would, who does not have health insurance and would be eligible for the, um, uh, the marketplace. Give me an older person. Somebody tell me the story of an older person. Yes, and back. Perfect, perfect. So here, here's a woman 
who is in her 60s but is not yet 65 because when you're 65 you can get Medicare. So that's one thing to remember. The marketplace is not for anybody over 65. They have something else. But she wants to retire from her job. She's ready to retire, but she can't or she won't because she knows she's going to lose her health insurance and she will have to go two or three years before she gets Medicare. And, and what would happen if something bad happened? It could destroy the whole family financing. So she then would be able to get health insurance through the marketplace and depending on their income, might even get a subsidy that would help her pay for it. But at least she could get um, insurance. Right now, if she went out and tried to buy a commercial policy, uh, because of her age, if nothing else, it would be very expensive. And most likely, she has some pre-existing condition who doesn't when they're 63. Um, and so she might not even be able to get it. So that's an excellent example. Yes? Right. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, that uh, if you lose your job or quit you, your job, then you can, and you lose your insurance. For example, if you get fired or quit your job, you have the option right now of continuing the insurance you have as long as you pay for it. It's called COBRA, and that lasts for usually 18 months. Problem is, it costs a lot of money to pay for it. So uh, uh, th and, and, that and won't just, be the only option anymore. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, what I was saying is that if you are offered employer-covered insurance through your employer, um, you can't not take that one and go to the marketplace unless you can prove that that one's too expensive. So but that has if you're no longer with, working, then yes, there's no waiting period. You could apply for the marketplace. So if, if you're working, that's true. But if you're not working, you're fired or you quit, that's another thing. Give, give me an example of somebody who's middle-aged and has a family who might not have insurance and would be eligible. Yes, ma'am. And my uh, adopted son, he is 23, so I'm a citizen, but uh, he's in the process. So I have him in school, and it's hard for him me to try to apply for him for insurance so i don't know and it's right. costing me like one thousand something to get a private insurance because of his status one thousand a month uh no no the six months for six months okay all right so well 23 years old is not really middle age unless you're 15 but we'll take that anyway <laughs> um but yeah that is is a good point a, a young person who could um, be on his family's insurance, um, but it, it may be uh, depending on the kind of uh, policies that you're offered through your work, it may be very expensive to bring him on with you. Um, he would be able to go to the marketplace himself and plug in his income and his age and buy a policy that most likely would be quite affordable. Um, and I had some slides that actually went through the, um, the, uh, the dollars on this. So let me try to reconstruct that for a 23-year-old person who, say, goes to school and works part-time and makes $18,000 a year. Okay, maybe they, they're a bartender or they work in a grocery store part-time. While they're going to school, they make $18,000 a year. So if, if they would go to the marketplace, they would find out that a commercial policy would probably cost about $3,000 a year. However, they, their income is quite low. It's about 150% of the poverty level. So they would get a substantial um, subsidy, probably more than $2,000 a year. So their monthly payment would be probably about $80 a year for a silver plan. And if, and if they wanted to go for an even less expensive plan, a bronze plan, which does make sense for young, healthy people who don't expect to be using 
any medical services. They could probably get a policy for about $30 a month. And that is a policy that covers everything. It's part of the, it meets the same standards that all do now. So uh, probably for your son, that would be affordable for him. Um, somebody give me an example of a, a middle-aged uh, couple, married couple with some kids. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that's, again, uh, somebody who retires early or is let go, and that happens a lot in the workplace now where people have been working their whole lives, but they get to be 55 or something like that, and then they get let go because the company can hire a, le a le less expensive worker, um, and then they're, they're stuck because they don't qualify for Medicare until 65. They can go to the marketplace and depending on their income, get insurance that they can afford. Um, so we're going to have to move along here, but those are some examples. Now, here's a, a message that I hope you all take to heart. Don't take my word for any of this. Do it yourself. This is how we can best learn about the Affordable Care Art Marketplace and Obamacare and help people who need our assistance. We learn by doing. So for yourself or, or family or someone you know who's uninsured, find out how much getting insured would cost per month and then answer the question, can you or they afford it? Do that as your homework tonight. And this is how, it's pretty easy. You go to www.healthcare.gov. You click on the button that says, how can I get coverage at lower cost? And they will guide you to what's called the Kaiser Family Foundation Calculator. You plug in a few items, and then instantly they will tell you exactly how much you need to pay. And then you decide, is that going to work or not? Do it a couple times, you know, for different kinds of people. And in that way, you will get an idea of what this is all about, and you can really help people who have uh, the need to get insurance. Yes? Um, I think you are. I'm not sure. Uh, I would think if you sign up for catastrophic plan and then you find out you have cancer, um, you're going to have to pay probably the first five or six thousand uh, dollars of the plan. But then after that, the plan will kick in because that qualifies as catastrophic. So it's going to cost you, but it's not going to destroy you. Yeah. I see. Okay. And the second one is if you have somebody who's 65 and they want to keep working, are they obliged to go into a Medicare program? Do they have a choice? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Um, do they have a choice of keeping their company's policy or taking Medicaid is the real question, right? Medicare. Medicare, Medicare. right. Medicare or their company's policy. I don't think they're obliged to take Medicare, but I don't really know. Okay. I meant as a solo practitioner if the choice was Medicare or are they able to go into the marketplace? Yeah. Well, if they are eligible for Medicaid, they are not qualified. They may not go into the marketplace. Yeah. Um, if you are uh, 65 but you want to keep working, um, you don't have to take Medicare, but there is a part of Medicare that you should start paying into so that you don't get penalized for not participating in it uh, later. So Social Security Administration actually is the one that enrolls individuals into Medicare once they're enrolled, then CMS is the one that maintains the relationship. But um, they could check with the Social Security Administration on, um, I believe it's Part B, that they should start uh, uh, paying so that they don't get penalized for not being uh, uh, enrolled in that later on when they choose to take it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I have a question um, regarding families. Like, let's say they just have one child, but they do have 
insurance offered through their employer. However, the family plan, whether it's one child or seven children, is the same cost. So um, for children, if the cost is, is too high according to what they feel their, you know, the personal budget is, are they still obliged to take advantage, to enroll their children, their child there, or is the child eligible for a marketplace plan? Well, um, if your uh, company offers you a plan that meets the standards that are now required and is, doesn't cost more than, I think it's 9.5 percent of your income, then you are not eligible for a different marketplace plan. However, if it doesn't, if it costs more than that, or if it's not a legitimate policy that covers what you need according to the standards, then you are. No, I think I think it's the premium that cannot be the year premium cannot be over nine point cent of your yearly income, annual premium, annual income. So, like another question, I know. I know it was mentioned that you can't jump out of an employer plan to jump on to the market plan. But if you have um, a family and your family member is uh, 20 or 21, can they be dropped and then that young person go ahead and go on to the marketplace? Yeah, they can get their own. Okay. Let me finish the slides and then whatever time we have left, we'll take some more questions. So this is everybody's homework tonight. Please do that. If you want to be effective as a champion, you need to kind of learn this process and it's easy and fun to do. Here's some information. Um, key numbers. Uh, the, the city of San Antonio is, is now printing up thousands of brochures with all of this information on it. Uh, we would be happy to share that with you. Um, they're not ready yet. They'll be ready by next Tuesday. So, who, uh, so who's ever um, takes responsibility can contact us and we can get you that information. Um, this, this is what the city of San Antonio's uh, promotional material will look like. Uh, and I think it will be helpful for, for those of you to have in the field uh, when you do work as champion. And uh, finally, I'd like to close by saying that th this is about what we can do to help people who are not insured get insured. Let's focus on that. And don't be confused or disoriented or scared away by all the disinformation that is cascading, it seems like, from all points now. But uh, in my opinion, it's only a few people who actually do not want this to work. Uh, they want it to fail. Let's be honest about it. They do not want people to get insured. Just last night, I watched a website directed at young people, like most of yourselves, uh, that went uh, to some length saying that young people should not go to the marketplace and should not get insured under the marketplace tenants and told a lot of really pretty disgusting lies like saying if you do then all of your medical information will be public knowledge your sexual activity etc once you give your information away uh, absolutely false. And they said the plans are all overpriced. Like in Florida, you can get a, a health insurance plan for $37 a month. Well, that's true, but then what do you get for that? Basically nothing. It's a fraud. Um, so, and this stuff is coming from all corners now. Um, we've all heard that Texas Senator Ted Cruz spent 21 hours filibustering in the Senate against Obamacare, um, reading Dr. Seuss and anything else he could think of to fill up the time. So that's the atmosphere that we're operating in. So we need to focus. Do not get confused or disoriented. And my message to people who do not have health insurance is that 
No one can stop you from getting health insurance. But you can stop yourself if you get confused or scared away or disoriented by all this commotion and noise. So that's, I think, a big part of our job is to cut through that and get the person to the place they need to be. And I think I'll quit because there are some other points of business we need to take care of, but it's been a pleasure and good luck to you all. All right. So at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard about what it is that's going on across the nation and here in Barrett County with regards to the ACA and the insurance marketplaces. And now it's time to come to the question, well, what do we do about it? How is it that we go out there and we get involved? And that's what we're here today to do. Before we start, I want to introduce our project again, the Act Together for Health project. And what this project is, is an opportunity for us as members of the community as students and as leaders here to be empowered, informed, and able to go out and provide information. Now, before I begin, let me just say that this project is very near and dear to our hearts. It is a collaboration between our Center for the Medical Humanities and Ethics and our Student Government Association. Uh, and I wanted to express on Dr. Bergen's behalf that uh, she's let us know she regrets she couldn't be here with us this morning. But she does want each and every one of us here to know that she recognizes and the center recognizes the potential for impact that we as students and that we as members of this community have to make change and that they cherish the opportunity to work with us moving forward. So as we look at what it is that we're here to do, let's go and talk about this project. Now, when we were considering how it is that we mobilize ourselves as students and as volunteers in this community, we started to talk about a few different key aspects uh, that were important to our success. To that end, we've actually put together a document that's our executive summary. You all have a copy of that in your folders for today. Now, what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about the project, about that executive summary, and hit some of the highlights of how it is that we're going to go out and how we're going to be the agents of change, and we're going to be the individuals charged with really working hard to ensure that accessible, understandable information is circulated in our community. So. The first question is, well, what's this Act Together uh, for Health project all about? I think Dr. Schlenker and Melanie and Ms. Nino have identified very well that no project is going to be successful unless it is rooted in the community. And that is at the heart of what it is that we're doing here. So you're going to see that ours is a collaborative effort. We're working very hard to ensure that we're aware of what the city's up to. I know uh, Dr. Schlenker had mentioned there are sites where individuals will be able to go and receive information. And we're wanting to make sure that we're supplementing that, that we're covering a broader base, and that we're able to be effective in our community. Beyond that, we have to look at, well, what are the ways that we're going to be able to make sure we can do this? One of them is this today. Uh, get your Affordable, Hair, Affordable Care Act together. Uh, this program is designed to offer you an orientation to the ACA and some of its provisions, and it's about contextualizing the insurance marketplace for us here in Bear County. And I think we can see that uh, it's definitely a very important need that we have in our community. Next, I want to thank Dr. Schlenker for updating our numbers. When we wrote this, we were under the impression that there were something like 300,000 uninsured in Bear County who would be eligible. Of course, now we know that's about 200,000 individuals, but that uh, it goes to show that we have a lot of opportunity out here in Bear County to make a huge difference for hundreds of thousands of people. And I think that's where we come in. So we have an idea about, well, what is this project for? What is its goal? And as we look at how we're going to attain our goal, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is it that we actually do? I like to think that our activities are divided into four main areas. One, we're identifying sites in the community where we would be a useful asset to that uh, organization or to the population. Two, after we've done this orientation with you, our role is to mobilize students to approved sites to go out and share some of what we've learned today. Third, we're very interested in providing quality information and resources to the populations that we serve. So it's not just about finding whatever infographic, whatever piece of information out online. It's about making sure 
we've verified their validity, and that we've condensed them in a way that is easily understood and is easily digestible by the population that we serve. Finally, and again, I want to emphasize that ours is a community service learning project, we're very interested in monitoring our progress and ensuring that not only are we responsive to the needs of our community, but that you as participants, you as educators, are receiving the best possible experience from this uh, opportunity that we can give. So that's a lot of work. How is it that we propose to coordinate all of this? Well, over this project, we have a total of five leadership teams that have stepped up to help direct our activities. We have lead leadership teams in the areas of publicity, which helps us get information about the fact that we exist out into the community. We have a group dedicated to information and educational tools, again, that goes and seeks up-to-date, relevant, fresh information that our community can use and makes it something that's easily understood and well-delivered. We have an implementation committee, which is in charge of coordinating with the city, with our community partners, and with you as individuals who are going to be participating with us to ensure that we are not duplicating efforts and that we are being as effective as we can be in the community. We have a committee that's dedicated to the t-shirts, slogans, and logos that we're going to use. I mean, what's, what's a project that's boring, right? It's all about how do we make sure we're exciting, we're something refreshing for the community. And I hope you all picked up your t-shirt on the way and they look lovely, let me just say. <laughs> uh, the very last thing, again, emphasizing that our role is as student learners offering service to the community. So, again, to meet that community service learning aspect and uh, uh, focus of our project, we are very interested in doing monitoring and evaluation, which I hope you've all done your pre-surveys by now. Um, but in any case, the fact of the matter is we're out to not only monitor our experience, but as we'll talk about later, monitor the experience that our community that we serve is having as well. So, okay, that's kind of the back end of it. What is it that we're actually going to go out and do in the community? How are we working with the communities we serve? To get started with, we're out to do some education about the Affordable Care Act and, more importantly, about the health insurance marketplace. Our role here is not to go out and make up information or to interpret this or that law. It's merely to take information that's out there in existence and amplify it. Put it out there in a way that's relevant, easily understood, and accessible to the populations that we serve. Our goal is not to be a political organization, never to take stances ideologically. We're not intending to go into the community and say, oh, it's right or it's wrong or it's good or it's bad to have insurance. No, we're merely there to state this is an avenue that now exists. It's available to you. Here's how you can access it. So don't be concerned about this being an ideological battle as well as uh, one of actually putting resources into the community. Finally, and I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have our Information and Educational Tools Committee, we are out to develop easy to understand resources that are relevant to our community. As of right now, and as we'll see in a moment, we actually already have brochures that have condensed some of the information about how to find uh, health insurance marketplace information in both English and Spanish, and we're working very carefully to make sure that we keep that up to date and relevant and accurate. Now, because I know that the kind of people that are in this room today are the sorts that are always looking, well, how do we do even more? How do we get more involved and more active in our community? Here's what we've got. I can tell you from an implementation uh, team standpoint that we're looking for the opportunities with partners in this community to increase our role and to uh, open the doors, hopefully, to be more involved in our community. And so I want you to know you should stay tuned. There are more things coming. So, okay. We're going out into the community. We're providing education. At the end of the day, though, you're not expected to be navigators. You're not expected to be certified application counselors. They'll tell you in school, they'll tell you in whatever training you have formally for your profession, it's OK to say, I don't know. And that's what this is all about. This is actually the backside of our brochure, which you should also have received a copy of on your way in. You'll see right here in this middle column, we've got in links to the resources that individuals will need to reach healthcare.gov, to reach information specific to Bear County. So our hope is not to send you out there and then get you into a dark place and expect you to wander back out. We do have the resources there for individuals to be able to help themselves also learn a little bit more. 
when we go out into the community, we have very concrete things we want to address, things that are sort of going to be our take-home message for everyone. And here's what those are. When we look at the steps to get coverage, folks need to know. You have to have your documents ready, so whether that's your social security number or your um, proof of residency. Um, then they have to know, well, you have to register. As uh, Ms. Nino was mentioning to us, you will need to have, for security reasons, your username, your login, uh, and that's going to be one of the steps we uh, direct individuals to. Next, we're also going to direct individuals, well, it's not enough just to register and have this login existing. You actually have to apply for coverage. That's the whole point. From there, we're going to let folks know exactly what we've already been told. This is not a place to go to get free coverage. It's a place to go to compare what your options are as far as getting coverage. And so we're going to make sure that folks know. Compare your options. Shop around. It's okay to do. Finally, the step that we're all really hoping to drive people in this community to is to actually enroll. As Dr. Schlenker was telling us, something like half of the uninsured in Bear County are eligible for some kind of insurance through the marketplace, whether it's subsidized or not. And I think that's a very key demographic for us to keep in mind, because those are the individuals that we eventually want to push towards this enrollment. OK. So we've got this leadership team, this project designed to go out into the community. Fine. How do we decide where in the community we're going to work, though? Again, we have our leadership teams within this project that are working very hard with other leaders in the community and with individuals and organizations in the community to identify potential partners out in the San Antonio and Bear County area. After we've talked to those partners, after we've made sure that the community is aware of who we are and what we want to do, then we seek to build a relationship with them and actually receive invitations from them. Now, I don't know about y'all. We had mentioned the door knocking approach maybe not being the best approach. And I, I, I would agree wholeheartedly. So we're seeking to be invited somewhere, not to show up randomly on a doorstep. Uh, and so we're seeking these invitations. Once we receive invitations, from sites out in the community, they have to meet very particular criteria for us to be able to even go and visit them, for us as a leadership team to send you as students and volunteers out into them. And so uh, I'm adopting Dr. Berggren's acronym, we serve approved sites. And what does that mean? Sites that are approved for teams to go out into are safe. We are invited to them. We are relevant to the population that they uh, espouse or that they um, have within their auspices, and then they're vetted by our implementation committee. Now, those four things are a couple of things I really would like to speak about more in particular. Safety is our key priority. You as students and as volunteers are out to do good work in the community, and it's very important to us as a leadership team that you're being sent to safe places. So we're doing our very best and our best due diligence to ensure that you're not going to walk into any sort of a negative situation and that, in general, the site where you're going is going to be safe for you as volunteers and students to be present in. The other one that I would really like to emphasize is the importance of relevance. Uh, Dr. Bergen has made the example that it wouldn't really make sense for us to go to USAA's campus and try to talk to them about health insurance. They are the largest health insurance provider here in San Antonio. Rather, we're looking for those communities that are going to benefit from having uh, information and who are largely going to be uninsured populations. So then the final question is, well, is this already being done? And if so, how are we any different? And I like to highlight these four aspects of our project that make us stand out from anything that may already exist uh, in the city or in the state. One, community partnership. Again, it's been incredibly important. It's been a high focus of ours to make sure that we are talking to the Metro Health District, that we are talking to our partners in UHS uh, and here at UTESCA to ensure that we have uh, community organizations that are looking for our involvement. Careful coordination is a key part of that. We're making sure that you're not being sent to places that someone else has already gone or that places are being missed. We're making sure that we care carefully coordinate so that we can supplement what it is that the city is doing uh, with their efforts. We're taking on an interprofessional approach. I'm sure you all saw you have a wonderful sticker on your name badges, and those correspond to your uh, profession and discipline. Now, the fact of the matter is we're very interested in part of the learning being working with folks from other professions and seeing how it is 
that we benefit from each other's insights and how we translate that into a benefit for the community. Finally, the CSL model. Again, it's not about a shotgun approach to going and doing service in the community. It's about how do we make it structured? How do we meet uh, measurable objectives and criteria? And then how do we adapt and respond to what it is that we're learning in the field? So with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take a break here. I'm going to pass it over to Ms. Victoria Flores, who's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the upcoming sites where we're going to go out and do this work. All right, so who thinks they're ready to go out? Oh, come on, y'all. Yes, no, maybe. Okay, well. There we go. Okay, so we have a few, uh, actually we have quite a few upcoming events ready to go. So who's ready to go out tomorrow to Cyclovia and have some fun on the street? I know we heard it's a big party in San Antonio, right? So what we're going to go do out there is the Fiesta Charitable Corporation is hosting a health fair on their parking lot, which is, sits off of Broadway. So that's going to be our first site to go out and begin speaking to people and sharing the information that you have in this pamphlet to prepare them for October 1. Now we have three events on October 1. That's National Night Out. So you have St. Timothy's Parish, Roosevelt High School, and the Church of Reconciliation have all invited us to come out for their National Night Out activities and speak to their members, to speak to people that come into those events for them. Um, the Utesca Family Health Clinic has invited us out. San Fernando has their fair next weekend on Saturday. Methodist Healthcare Ministries has something coming up the very following week. Two weekends from now, the Fiesta Charitable Corp is hosting another health fair out at Traders Village, which we are invited to go to. And then the Young Women's Leadership Academy. So what does this mean for you? Here's the overview. Here's all sites that we're ready to go. These take place over the next month. So this is our first set of assignments as students um, and as partners. What we're gonna do here in a little bit is actually form teams. We're gonna form 10 teams of 20. So each team will get an assignment and your team facilitator will have that. What I want you to keep in mind between now and then is a site that you would wanna to go to and a date that works for you. So dates and sites are available. Think of where you would wanna go and then also think about would you be willing to be a team leader for your team? So it's gonna be really, really important as we form these teams that we have leadership through those teams. Now your responsibility as a team leader, um, you're gonna to go to a team leader training. So our implementation committee will help inform you about ways to be um, a better team leader and to facilitate your team further. Um, you're going to communicate with your team and our implementation facility. We're gonna to work together to assign you assignments. So. These are the only the first 10 that we have for the next coming month. Enrollment lasts until March 31st. So there's more events that are coming. Your team will be going to other events. Some of these might um, turn into ongoing invitations. So we might be going there on a weekly basis, a bi-weekly basis, or a monthly basis. As your team leader, you will work with the implementation committee to, as we delegate those team assignments to your team, um, your responsibility will to be to ensure that all of your team members are ready to go for these events, that you have the information that you need to be an effective team as you go out and speak, um, and then communicating with those sites on an individual basis if there's any individual needs that you have to meet. So take a look at these dates. Be ready to go because we're fixing to form teams. All right. So again, community service learning, an incredible opportunity to learn what we don't know and learn how to learn what we know better. Uh, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce members from our monitoring and evaluation committee to talk a little bit about the process we're using to uh, keep track of our progress. Hi, so I'm Christy, and this is Anu, and we're medical students. And so we've come up with some tools to um, help you all figure out what communities that uh, we're serving and just to make sure that um, we're being effective. And so the first thing is whenever you guys came in, you should have completed a pre-survey and that's just to um, sort of see how ready you are, how much you know. And then now you guys in your packet have this orange paper and so you can complete your post-survey. 
And then in February or March, we're going to send this out again just to get some feedback from you guys about, um, about sort of what you thought about the whole community service learning activity. So you have in your packet also, you have two pages like this, and these are your event forms to fill out. And then you also have a purple page. This is your tip sheet, and this just gives you tips on how to fill this out. So the first one we have here is the health event report form. And so this one, you'll have one of these forms that you'll fill out for each event that you go to. Most of the things on there is pretty self-explanatory, and most of it you can just observe, check off sort of what type of population you see. Um, one thing to point out is that each team will have a data collection manager. And the data collection manager is responsible for making sure that all of these forms are filled out and that they are submitted online. Um, and you have a QR code at the bottom, and so that's an easy way for you to go ahead and submit it online. Um, for the first part, that big open space, you can just do check marks for how many people you see at each event. So if you're going to a health fair, if somebody stops by, you talk to them for a few minutes, give them a flyer, any sort of interaction, that's what's counted in that first part. And in the second part, where it says demonstration in-depth visits, we know that some of these conversations will turn into um, sort of longer interactions where you'll go through the whole process of how you get enrolled and give them more information. And we want to count those separately since that takes more of your time. And um, we have another outline that we'll go over for that. So I'm going to just talk to you all briefly about the second, um, the second survey you'll see. It's the demonstration slash in-depth visit survey, and that's what Christy was talking about if you have like a longer um, interaction with an individual. Um, we, um, in order to put this form together, we took a lot of time to figure out what would be relevant information. So um, the different things that we came up with, you'll see above here. I just want to highlight one of them, which is, do they use email? We don't actually need their email address, but there was some debate about whether or not you'll need an email address or at least know how to use email in order to sign up for um, entrance online. So we wanted to know, are the people we're talking to, do they have do they have an email or do they use email? And um, we would like this to be conversational, not just like a survey where you just randomly check off things on this list. So on the tip sheet are ways that we thought you could ask the question in a way that's meaningful to the person you're interacting with. And um, it's also, it's okay if you don't get all the information. We understand there's varying lengths of time you could spend with somebody. And this is just something we hope to collect, and whatever you get is what you get, and it doesn't mean anything bad or good about your interaction. It's just what you were able to gather during that time. And um, some of y'all brought up some information, like what about if they have internet access, all that kind of information, and that's something we'd like to track to see who we're reaching out to, and um, if we are reaching out to the target um, populations um, that the implementation team com comes up with. Um, and um, as you'll see, there's, um, one of the questions is, do you feel that they benefited from speaking with you? You can ask them in a different way. We have it on the tip sheet. And it's just to see if, if the information being provided is relevant to the individual and it's not a, it's not a reflection of you, it's of the information that we're providing. And um, you'll see there the QR codes at the bottom and that's where they can be entered in online. And um, if you have any questions, I know we went through this a little quickly, you can feel free to contact us via phone or email, and our contact info is on the tip sheet. So yeah, that's it. And thank you so much for all your efforts, and we're really excited about this because it's a way to show um, all the efforts all of you are putting into this, and we're really excited to find out the results.